So here's an example of a hypothesis test. Um, so the example is as part of the Pew Research Center poll, subjects were asked if there is solid evidence that the Earth is getting warmer. Among 1,501 respondents, 20% said that there is not such evidence. Use a five, I'm sorry, use a 0 0.05 significant level to test the claim that less than 25% of the population believes there is not solid evidence that the Earth is getting warmer. So the first thing I want to point out to you is that the way I know that this is a hypothesis test is because it actually says test the claim. So anytime you see the word test or do the data show or anything like those words, it means you're doing a hypothesis test. All right, the next thing I want to point out to you is that um, this poem talks about um, percentages, um, talks about um, another percent here, and so when it talks about those kind of information, it usually means we're dealing with a proportion. Because again, proportions are measures of the percent of people, or I shouldn't say percent, but the, um, the number of people out of a certain number who think a certain way. So we know this is a hypothesis test. We know it's a proportion test because of seeing those percentages. And so the very first step of every hypothesis test is to state the random variable and population parameter in words. Um, in this example, you're going to notice I typed a lot of stuff out because it's very wordy here and it takes a long time to write all the information out. So um, to speed things up a little bit, I did write out some of the information. Um, so what this says is um, the way we look at this now if we're dealing with proportions, proportions come from counting things. Again, it's the t number of people out of the total. So we had to have counted something. So in this case, we counted the number of people who believe there is not solid evidence. The reason that was that way is because that's what the question asked. That the Earth is getting warmer. Um, the parameter would be the proportion of people who believe that there is not solid evidence. The symbol we use for proportion is a P. So that's why that's a P there. So now we can actually write out the hypotheses. Um, remember, there are two hypotheses in every hypothesis test. The first one is HO, which is the null hypothesis. And then there's the alternate hypothesis, HA. The alternate hypothesis is what you're actually trying to prove. So let's see what we're trying to prove. We want to test the claim that less than 25% of the population believe that there is not solid evidence. So I always look for those kind of words less than, greater than, different from, to figure out what my HA would be. Since my parameter is P, then that's what I'm going to use. Um, less than looks like this, and I want to know if it's less than, that's 25%. So again, we will write that as a decimal. So that would be 25 people out of 100 people believe there's not solid evidence. That's a better way to think of proportions. The null hypothesis looks exactly like the alternate hypothesis, except that it's an equal sign instead of an inequality. So you have the same numbers here. Um, one of the mistakes that is common by students is they'll put different numbers in these two spots, but these two numbers should always be the same. The last thing to do is to state what your level of significance is. It's called your alpha level. Up here it does tell us it's 0.05. So it's a good idea to put it here. All right. The next step of having a hypothesis test is to state and check the assumptions. One of the mistakes I see a lot is that people don't state them. So we're going to state them first, and then we're going to check to see if they're right. The, um, since this is a proportion test, we do have three assumptions behind a proportion test. The first one is that we had a random sample of whatever we measured. The second is that we have the properties of a binomial, and the third is that we can approximate um, a normal distribution can be used um, for the sample proportion. So looking at this, um, the first one would be a random sample, but you don't want to just say a random sample. You want to say a random sample of what? So we, in order to get how many people believe there's not subtle evidence, we probably ask people their opinions. So we had a random sample of opinions of 1,501 people about whether the Earth is getting warmer was taken. 
If we go back to the problem, normally, because you didn't actually collect the data, you have to see if the problem tells you if it was a normal, I'm sorry, if it was a random sample. Looking up here, it doesn't tell us, but we do notice that it does talk about the Pew Research Center. The Pew Research Center has been doing um, data collection for many years, so we can pretty well be assured that they probably did a simple random sample. So that's what I would say, is that the problem doesn't state there's a random sample, but since the Pew Research Center was involved, most likely it was. Um, the next assumption is the properties of the binomial experiment have been met. Um, I haven't found a great way to write that in terms of the problem, so I usually just write that one as it is. But now let's look at what those binomial properties are. Um, you have to have two outcomes. So in this case, we either believe there's not solid evidence, or they do. So there's our two outcomes. Um, you have to have independent outcomes. So if one person believes there's not solid evidence, it does not affect another person believing there's not solid evidence. If you took a random sample, that should be true. Um, you have to have a certain number of people you talk to. In this case, we did talk to 1,501 people. And then the probability has to be the same for every single person. And that's where our HO comes into play. We are assuming that HO is true. So we are assuming that every single person has the same probability. Um, so we are able to say that we've met the properties of a binomial. Um, the last one's a little bit different. It's an approximation to a normal distribution can be assumed for the sample proportion. In other words, we're going to be allowed to use the normal distribution to figure out probabilities. Um, in order for this to be true, you have to have your number you had in the sample times your proportion. In this case, again, we're assuming HO is true. Um, that number has to be greater than or equal to 5. And n times q, with remember q, is 1 minus p. Um, so that product has to be greater than or equal to 5. This is just to say that we did, in fact, have a large enough sample. Since that's true in this case, we can use a normal approximation. So we have a lot of the preliminary work in place, so now we can go to the next step. The next step is the test statistic and p-value. So that's our next thing that we get to do now. So when we talk about the test statistic, um, that would be the statistic that goes along with our parameter. So the parameter is p, because we already used the Latin symbol, we have to then come up with another way to denote it. So if we don't have a better way, we just put a hat over top of it to mean it's a sample value. So this is a number coming from the sample. Um, sometimes you have to calculate this, so this would be your x value count found, how many people actually believe this, over your n value, how many people did you ask. Um, I like it that way better than percentages, but a lot of times it's given in percentages. So if we go back here, we will see, I need to get rid of some of this, that we actually have a 20% that said among those 1,500 people that were asked. So we now know that our p hat happens to be 0 .0, 0 0.20. So now we can get our test statistic. That was our sample statistic. Our test statistic would be um, the formula for it is p hat minus p over the square root of p times q over n. p hat we just found to be 0 0.20. p was again what HO assumed that p was equal to. So coming back over here you see that HO was assumed to be 0 0.25 for p. So that's the number we put in here. p again is 0 0.25 Q is 1 minus P, so that would be 0 0.75, and there were 1,501 people involved in this. You take out your handy-dandy calculator, and it tells you this value is negative 4.47. The negative sign means we're below the mean, um, and we're below that value, and so we end up with this number. The question is, how unusual is that number? And that's where your p-value comes into play. p-value actually says, how unusual is this number? 
If you're using the TI-83 or 84, you would use the command normal CDF. Um, if you're using any other technology, you would use their commands. There's R, there's um, even the uh, Excel will do normal CDFs for you. Um, you can even find normal ones on normal calculators online. Um, to do this, um, we have to know what the p-value actually is measuring. So it is the probability that rz that we found is less than this number we just came up with. So this is saying how unusual would it be to find a z smaller than this number we just came up with, assuming that ho is true. So thinking about this as a normal curve, the center of a normal curve is here, negative 4.47 is to the left of zero, and then you're shading everything below. So the shading starts at negative infinity. On the TI-83 and 84, you put in negative 1 E99 for a really small number. Um, then you ending the shading ends at negative 4.47. The mean of a normal standard normal distribution is 0, and the standard deviation is 1. Again, you can use any other technology for this. Um, when you do this, you actually come up with a really small number, so we usually just write that as 0, 0, 0, 0. It doesn't mean it's 0. It means that somewhere way out here is a number. We just don't want to write that many decimal places. All right, so now we're on our way. Um, the next piece is this. Once we have our data and calculations and all that fun stuff, the next piece is our conclusion. Um, we reject HO, we say HO is wrong, or we have evidence to say it's wrong, if our p-value is very, very small, um, and we fail to reject it if our p-value isn't very small. So, in other words, is this negative 4.47 unusual? If it is unusual and we saw it happen, then we would assume that our HO was wrong, and therefore our HO is correct. Um, if it's not unusual, then we can't say that. So looking at this, our conclusion in this case is this is a really small number. This is where your alpha level comes into place. If your um, p-value is smaller than your alpha level, then you reject HO. In this case, 0 0.000 is less than 0 0.05, so since the p-value of 0 0.0000 is less than 0 0.05, we're going to reject HO. So that's actually our conclusion. Then the last step is to tell people what that conclusion means. So this is where the interpretation comes in. This is where we tell everybody else. So at the 5% level, and that just tells people what confidence level you picked what alpha level you picked, level of significance you picked. I shouldn't have called it a confidence level, excuse me on that, it's slightly different. Um, this is basically saying that at this um, level of significance, there was enough evidence to support, well support what? We set out, let's go back here for just a moment, we set out to prove that the less than 25% of the population believes there's not solid evidence. We rejected HO in favor of HA. And HA says the proportion of people who believe there's not solid evidence, or it's just getting warmer, is less than 25% or 0.025. And that's what we were able to prove. That's what we have enough data to support. So there's enough evidence to support that the proportion of people who do not believe the Earth is getting warmer is less than 0 0.25.
and we're done.